Okay, I'm just gonna start unless I hear that it is not working. Um, so hi everyone, I'm uh, Jane Davies. Uh, I uh, got my master's in digital anthropology from UCL, um, and that within that subsection, I focus within space anthropology, um, looking at uh, 3D printing in lower Earth orbit and how that affects human culture today. But uh, I'm gonna focus on the moon today, um, and although uh, the moon in terms of anthropological study has not played, it, it's played a part. There's a lot of um, different kind of um, focuses on it, mostly with regard to religious studies um, and some focus on um, indigenous practice. But uh, I'm going to kind of go through a variety of um, different disciplines because anthropology is multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary, um, whatever word you choose to use. Um, so it kind of draws on many topics, even though there are subtopics like medical anthropology, linguistic anthropology, anthropology of religion. Um, these are all subsections which then draw on disciplines like um, politics, arts, biology, chemistry, anything you can really imagine. Anthropology kind of covers um, a broad range of topics. Um, so in this lecture, I'm just gonna go through a few different sections. Um, the first two I'm focusing mostly on uh, the Apollo missions because we are talking about the moon. Um, and that's um, for many, one of the kind of big first moments of, even though we all look up at the sky and we see the moon, that's one that really entered the sort of public conversation. Um, so first focusing on the view of the moon. So uh, how, how we kind of, we view the moon as we, uh, so how we view the earth as we view on our way to the moon. And then the second section will be the Apollo um, and the moon through different cultural lens. So how um, different cultures around the world viewed the Apollo mission and how that was with respect to their own visions. And uh, the final section, which will move slightly away from the Apollo mission and focus on uh, the moon and how it fits, fits into the future of space um, and what sort of narratives are at play uh, from the dawn of the space age to now in the sort of new space era. And then if we have time, I'll conclude with sort of uh, looking at how anthropology can be used in the lunar future. So, um, so, there are limited works, as I mentioned, <laughs> on, on space anthropology, but I wanted to um, touch on this quote from Paul Gilroy's book, uh, After Empire, which he states, images of the Earth photographed outside its orbit by the Apollo 1972 spacecraft um, have emerged as an emblem or signature of the, of the sorry, my screen is covered here, on space uh, planetary consciousness. So this is going to kind of relate to a lot of what I'm talking about in a second, but this this view of the Earth from the moon is really what has changed a lot of our cultural view of, of the Earth itself. And in this next section, I'm talking specifically about um, two photos that the Earthrise photo, which is on the left here um, with the moon, moon in the bottom, and then the blue marble from the Apollo 17 mission on the right. Um, so starting off, I want to just quickly turn to the the transcript that was taken that was recorded at the um, at the taking of this picture, the 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 moonrise. Sorry, the earth rise. And um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because that's going to take a, a while. But just wanted to pick out some key points, which were um, this this to set the scene. They're they're talking about um, sort of the how the moon is looking, and then suddenly the astronaut Anders says, "Oh my God, look at that picture there." there's the earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? And then Borman says, hey, don't take that. It's not scheduled. Shutter click. So it's this moment where they're seeing the earth kind of for the first time as this globe. And even though they don't have the sort of um, the scheduled amount of photographs that they should be taken, it was hard to not take a picture of this blue marble. And in between, um, in this next little section, they are kind of trying to find color film because the on this mission, they didn't think that they were going to be taking pictures of the Earth. They were planning to take pictures of the moon. Um, but when you go away to the moon and you look back at Earth, it's so beautiful. And so um, then at the end, they, they finally get a, a picture. and It's framed and it's beautiful. And it's like at this moment of seeing this colorful, beautiful blue oasis that we live on. And this is something that is picked up by Benjamin um, Lazier, who is a historian. Um, so I'm drawing on another discipline here, but he focuses on this sort of, um, these, these photographs as key cultural moments um, and how the this Earthrise photo gave rise to the Earthrise era um, and how in terms of um, 
he describes that uh, there's no avoiding the fact that there's a common expression of the word globalization and the phrases global environment, global economy, global humanity. These, these didn't exist before really the Earthrise era. They weren't part of the common lexicon. And as soon as we have this photo of ourselves that's from the moon, we're able to understand just a different view of the earth as this, as this interconnected thing. And following this, um, looking at the Apollo, the sorry, the blue marble, we can see how, um, as Lazier states, as it, th this photo is a stand-in for the idea of the whole Earth itself, it has acquired an iconic power that helps organize a myriad of political, moral, scientific, and commercial imaginations as well. And I think that also sort of relates to um, that, that popular Carl Sagan quote from the 1994 um, Pale Blue Dot, where he said, where he's, he's talking about, look at this, this is home. That's, that's where everyone you've ever loved, everyone you've ever known, everyone, everyone you've ever interacted with, they're all there. And so this view from the moon back at Earth is a very interesting one because it, 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 it creates this kind of totalitized um, and, and, and circular being almost. And that's also where the this, um, as Lazier points to, um, that James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis really gained popularity. It was um, around before that time, but like in the 1968, I believe, but um, it really gained popularity with this these these images of of the earth as a whole and and his hypothesis is that the earth is this self-regulating organism so it exists in itself and it's it's almost a living being that everything around it and everything that's part of it is is part of itself and that really gave rise to this new um understanding of a global economy and a and and the need for environmentalism because we understood the earth as something precious that even though we wanted to escape and go to the moon and explore the cosmos we still look back and we're so so um grasped and gripped by this beautiful blue oasis that we've come from so moving on to the next section um I want to talk about um, the Apollo and the moon through a different cultural lens. So I'm going to be speaking about this article specifically called Pity the Indians of Outer Space, um, Native American Views of the Space Program. Um, this is by uh, Jane Young. It is from 1987, so I'm sure some of the um, language in it is a little outdated, but um, I still think it's it's a good place to start um, because uh, Young offers some different interpretations and different knowledge systems of the of the moon, um, mostly or entirely focused on uh, Native Americans. So um, in over in America, but um, so she talks about the Skidi uh, Pawnee tribe and mentions how these people um, were, co were conceived by the stars. So for them, the sky is populated with beings who have kinship relationships to those on earth. So the sun, the moon, the stars are the father fathers, mothers, aunts, uncles of the people of the earth and ought to be treated with respect. So that's a totally different view of the moon than what we had, especially at the Apollo missions. Um, separately, the Zuni people similar to the Pawnee, see themselves as intimately related to the sun and the moon and the stars. So it's it's not really surprising that they perceive the actions of non-Native Americans towards the cosmological beings as, as not only disrespectful, but also dangerous. So they, they understood the moon in a different way that would have effects on, on their crops, for example. So if you're going there and you're drilling into the moon's surface, um, and that's a sort of sacred um, kin kinship relationship with yourself, that's going to have effects. Um, and then finally, um, the, the for the Pueblins, uh, the moon, like the sun, is not an object to be walked or traveled to, but a living being whose light is drawn through the Kiva hatchway during certain rituals. So the moon is, as as not just a rock, but as something that is is living, like how we how we began to view the earth through the blue marble, like it's it's something into itself. And so Young points to how these kind of narratives um, are important to pay attention to, but also um, where where she gets this title from um, is uh, from a transcript of a convocation of Native American scholars that took place in 1970, um, where they were sort of discussing the Apollo missions. And um, they're kind of referring to this Euro-American concept of the like American frontier um, that's based on this erroneous notion that um, the new world was unoccupied and hence available for exploration and exploitation. And that narrative is being 
it, it's it's hard when you come from a culture that has been um, uh, you know repressed and downtrodden and seeing um, celestial beings that you have a close relationship to being treated in a way that you feel like you were treated. Um, and so uh, they kind of looked at this and, and, and were saying, you know, it, they're saying pity the Indians and the buffalo of outer space. So the the indigenous people or the indigenous beings, the indigenous spirits that are on the moon, you have to think about how they're going through it. And, and similarly, um, the Navajo people, um, so early in the space program, NASA had uh, leased um, some Navajo land to do uh, sort of practicing the Apollo landings. And um, they invited a uh, Navajo tribal chairman, tri chairman, Peter McDonald, to go and observe these um, walking tests. And he also brought along with him a Navajo um, singer or medicine man. And the medicine man wanted to record a message for the astronauts to take to the moon to um, to, to play to the to the moon people, as he said. Um, and he spoke in Navajo to the recording, and um, they asked um, Peter McDonald what he had said, and he said he's telling the moon people to watch out for you guys carefully because you might screw things up on the moon the way you have on Earth. And um, these sort of knowledge systems are completely different and kind of at odds with with what we understand our, our sort of exploitation of the moon. And it's it's important to still re remind ourselves that these people do still exist and they do have an equal say in the moon, but that a lot of the time the, the rich are able to kind of um, set the pace and set the tone for space. Um, and similarly, in a different article by um, uh, Valentine, he also, he's focusing um, on the knowledge systems of the Apollo program and, um, specifically how like a variety of problematics about humans and their histories are fixed from the earth and in the imaginations of both settlement advocates and their critics um, explore these problems through the terrestrial sites but um, he focuses specifically on the sort of uh, the response to the Apollo missions and he in one reference is a civil rights activist Reverend Ralph Abernathy who protested the Apollo 11 missions um, and he was specifically protesting these kind of uh, contrasting the in I want to say insane but the, the massive budgets that were put towards NASA's um, missions to the moon while there was poor housing and education and violence and racial discrimination against um, black people in America and then in a similar vein the poet um, Jill Scott Heron wrote a, a spoken word sort of song poem called Whitey on the Moon in 1970s and it goes uh, I can't pay no doctor bills but Whitey's on the moon 10 years from now, I'll still be paying while Whitey's on the moon. And he continues, um, hot water, no toilets, no lights, but Whitey's on the moon. And I think it's important to look at how the moon, uh, although for uh, Euro Western culture and for, for spacefaring nations is this um, beacon for um, exploration and for science, at the same time, it is also signifying to a, a minority population who have already been through a lot that there are that they're not a priority still that um these are just sort of um propagating the same cultures of exploitation over and over again so moving on to hopefully a, uh i mean it may be a bit more positive note um not that any part is any less important than the other, but um, I want to focus a little bit on, on the future. So how does the moon fit into um, the future of space? And in this section, I'm going to focus on um, World War II to the 1970s and the visions of the lunar future. So those are kind of focused around technological advancements. Um, and then the new space area, sorry, era. And then um, this sort of continuation of nationalist pride in geopolitics, where I'm going to provide some more um, recent examples to be able to kind of show how you can look through an anthropological lens at uh, the moon and how you can still study it, even though we're quite far away. <laughs> so World War II to the 70s is a very interesting time uh, for lunar exploration and space exploration, of course, um, obviously with the sort of aftermath of World War II and the uh, the sort of context of the Cold War and how um, this the, the Apollo moon missions 
kind of signified the end of the Cold War. So it's a very curious time. <laughs> um, and uh, with more equipment in space, it sort of becomes more and more concrete and geographical. So in the same way that we are looking at pictures of the moon through Earthrise and through the blue marble, we're also able to understand the geographies of the moon and the geographies of Earth. And it becomes, they come, become more of a place that we're able to kind of understand and perhaps colonize. Um, and outer space is sort of seen as this ultimate view of modernity, aside from also nuclear power, which is also seen as this um, very modern thing. And um, as uh, Alexander C.T. Geppert um, describes in this article about imagining outer space, so it's sort of the public imagination of space, he says, um, in a few years, experts agreed gigantic space mirrors, nuclear wonder weapons, manned space bases, and numerous other imagined technologies would be positioned in the near-Earth orbit while the permanent colonization of the moon, followed by Mars and later cosmic unknown beyond our solar system, would be, was believed to be the only, only a matter of time. And I think what I'm trying to point to here is how the moon is seen as this, as this amazing technological advancement in the future. So with all these things like um, nuclear weapons, gigantic space mirrors, all these sort of almost unbelievable technologies at the time that colonizing the moon was seen as this um, sort of utopic future, something that we'd be able to do um, and part of our, um, in the name of progress, I guess. Um, and nonetheless, it's still sort of this um, Euro Western centric narrative of settling and colonizing, um, which I don't think we necessarily should move away from that term colonizing, because I think um, it is what is happening. So um, providing another word or another guise for it can sometimes kind of it, it it's it's not worth erasing the, pro the, the problem and the sort of um, regimes of exploitation that also are related to it. And so in a, in a separate article, so what happened to the future? So this vision, this after the 1970s, um, the, 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 the space race and space became a lot less sexy. It wasn't really at the forefront of culture as it, as it had been um, in this sort of quite brief Apollo era. Um, and space proponents focused on the idea of establishing human presence in low earth orbit as a precursor to um, sustained uh, human space settlement, but it, it, there, were, there was literature at the time coming out like the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth, which Valentine describes as um, with his warnings of social collapse and the necessity of retrenching global socioeconomic, socioeconomic structures in order for humans to live within their ecological means, catalyzed both dystopic visions of an imminent doomed world and the counter visions of the prosperous and ever-expanding human future. So we see this, this interesting play of expanding human future and prosperity and all kinds of things off earth, like um, space-based solar power, which I'll get to in a second. But at the same time, there's sort of crisis happening <laughs> and, and concerns that we're not living within our ecological means with, Ga with the Gaia hypothesis. And yet reasons for settling in space still remained. So as Valentine notes, humans still needed a frontier for space and human and human deaths. It was almost a human destiny to go into space. While at the same time, the OPEC oil embargo, energy crisis or oil crisis was going on. Um, it, it, it at the same time was a distraction, but then also was a sort of sociopolitical um, rationale for space settlements. So this use of space-based solar power, having settlements in space who tended to those space stations for this sort of limitless power um, were sort of an ideal view of the future. But they kind of almost went a step too far and, and, and lost the, the public, um, the public uh, belief in them, I guess the word is. Like they're sort of... Um, able to follow these these almost zany or um, out of out of nowhere ideas almost even though they had scientific backing so space based solar panel so, sorry space based solar power has has been around since 1968 even though it's only really just coming to fruition um, in terms of pu uh, public funding as we as we speak really and lastly before i move on i want to just quickly touch on this this view of um, this ideological change that happens between the 1970s and the 2010s, specifically in the 2010s, where, um, as Valentine, oh, sorry, as um, Valentine notes, the ideological underpinnings of space settlement movement shifted from a leftist 
commitment to social projects um, of a new commons and space to a rightist and privatized individualistic mode. So it's this shift from the um, kind of socialist view of creating these uh, equal settlements where everyone there's no sort of uh, racism in space there's no there's no indigenous peoples in space so there's no people that we need to worry about taking their land and it's the sort of beautiful view of, of humanity in space but then it kind of starts to shift into this privatized um capitalist s system as we're seeing today with the with the rise of new space and so these renewed visions of the future uh, and the excitement that we're we're kind of experiencing right now is this sort of capitalist um, system that is allowing the space sector to continue to grow and to gain notoriety and to gain um, sort of public buy-in. So focusing now then on sort of the, what we can look at now. So what can someone who is looking at anthropology of the moon study? So um, as I focus in digital anthropology, my focus is on um, online communities and digital methods. So not necessarily going somewhere, which is very helpful when we're looking at the moon, because um, I don't know if you're aware, but it is not affordable to go to the moon. Um, and it is not easy to go there, especially as an anthropologist. Um, we're not a priority, I don't think yet, but, um, we can still study it from the ground because a lot of lunar culture is Earth-based. Most of what I've discussed today are things that are are the Earth's conception. Although these photographs, for example, came from outer space, we're still a lot. Even those of us who've never been to space and seen our beautiful blue marble um, on its own, we can still sort of understand what it's like to be off the world or to be on the moon looking back at the Earth. And I want to kind of question these these current narratives that are taking place around the moon. And I and I want to I want to kind of pose the question, um, not looking for an answer because I I have no idea. <laughs> but um, if there's a way of of having a sort of more pluralist view of the moon rather than this very specific view at the moment, which is sort of focused on using the moon as um, as a resource. Uh, and as a as a as a sort of resource to exploit. So, so some some titles that are mentioned here are um, by ESA saying helium three mining on the lunar surface. MIT says here's how we could mine the moon for rocket fuel. NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab says the lunar gold rush how mining could work. Um, sorry, how moon mining could work. And then Freethink who says can we turn the moon into a gas station? Um, and I think it's very telling this this very um, big shift in narrative where we started as um, in the 1970s and, and World War II as this view of being on the moon and living on the moon and having settlements in this quite like cosmopolitan view of being somewhere else. Whereas now it's sort of like, okay, it's a stop on the way to Mars. We kind of, and it's useful because there's water there so we can use it for fuel, but it's not really seen as a destination anymore. It's seen as sort of a jumping off point. Um, and I'm, and I'm curious if, if we can kind of, um, take on different narratives and understand the moon um, differently. Because when we look up, you know, for, for the first time in human history, we might have satellites going around the moon and we might be able to see their lights at night, um, even if it's like a, a, a partial moon, for example, that we can still see these lights going on. In it. And that's something we won't have experienced before. And, and the moon kind of belongs to everyone. Um, we'll see how that goes when treaties play out, but in terms of everyone kind of has their own relationship to it, we can see it every night pretty much. And it'll, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. Um, one quite uh, recent development that I want to talk about, um, just to mention before we I close up here, is this um, perception of lunar programs. So although I've spent the last couple of minutes talking about how it's just a resource to be exploited, um, it is important still to note um, that it is, still a place where geopolitics play and play out and still a point for governments. So um, this is from the second mission from the um, IS, ISRO, so India's Space Research Organization. Um, and the it's referring to the one that happened in 2019, the Chan, Chandrayaan, sorry if I pronounced that wrong too. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting to look at sort of the media representation from a international um, news outlet, the BBC, who's saying um, that the, the title of the article is Rocket Launch, is India a space superpower? And although the lander Vikram and the rover Pragyan 
um, crash into the moon's surface. Um, it still was an important moment for India to put themselves sort of on this lunar or uh, lunar map. And even we've seen recent um, recent missions from iSpace, from Japan. Um, it still is a is a place where governmental bodies, whether through private corporations or through their own um, space programs, are looking to get to the moon and are as this sort of um, power play between different nations. It, and even so, oh, hold on, there we go. And then even um, as of two weeks ago on July 14th, the Chandrayaan 3 went up. Um, and I think, and we, and BBC again commented saying um, it would make India only the fourth country to achieve a soft landing on the moon after the US, the former Soviet Union and China. And that is a, that is a really quite a significant list of countries to be among in terms of spacefaring nations. The US, Soviet Union and China are three of the major superpowers of space. Um, and, you know, even uh, I'm based in the UK and the UK, we have our own um space strategy to, for making the UK a space superpower. And I'm sure that um, Italy has the same. Um, and it's this this idea of competing on a uh, international scale with other nations. And it's quite, um, you know, the, the second quote from the BBC that mentions the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called the successful space launch a new chapter in the country's space odyssey, which also the references to science fiction throughout the space sector, I would love to get into, but I don't have time for today, um, but yeah, it's just interesting this kind of view on the, of the global of the global um, conversation. And I want to also quickly touch on two articles from Indian online newspapers um, to also demonstrate how these play out as a form of national pride. So India Today's title is ISRO, so the Indian Space Research Organization. Uh, Chandiran Three mission is the potential to boost India's economy. So looking at this is an opportunity for the economic development, economic growth. That's a that's a big push for the lunar missions. So the moon becomes this um, this signifier of economic prosperity. And separately, um, an article that I found um, really interesting was uh, referenced by the Economic Times um, called "As Chandrayaan Three Braces to Land the Moon." Here's why Pakistan lagged behind, um, and the caption was: "While India ticked one." one after the other boxes from ISRO, focusing on IT, opting for a modern education system. Pakistan kept on struggling with its internal conflicts and or orthodox education system. And why this is so interesting is obviously there are there have been tensions between India and Pakistan since partition in 1947. Um, and it's quite telling that they are still playing out even as we enter a, a, a new sort of space realm with it for India, that it's still a, a point of tension. Um, and this is the conclusion. So I'm going to you be free of me ranting at you um, sh shortly. Um, but I'll just quickly conclude with how can we use anthropology for lunar futures? Um, so anthropology is as a discipline, as I've mentioned, is quite multi interdisciplinary. So you can really draw on anything. And that's why it's so it's such a privilege to be part of this um, summer school, to be able to chat about it and, and be among other um, experts from various different industries. But it's important to be paying attention to the narratives perpetuated by private companies, governments, space agencies, in this, and all in the sector, and how those shape the public perceptions. Um, and by doing and in doing so, you need to sort of concentrate on local understandings. So from an anthropological lens, you need to kind of really situate your study. So whether that's um, at a singular space company, at a space agency on a specific project um, with a on a specific online community, for example, like looking in the comments of the Artemis program, really anything that you can quite get quite niche into and be able to talk to people and understand how they're understanding it. Um, and, and develop those relationships to really gain a, a, a deeper um, view of what's happening and to be able to kind of communicate those and place them within the context of the larger space environment. So examining how human culture of the moon affects um, the culture on the earth and vice versa. So as we go to the moon, how will our culture in on the moon affect how we see earth? So if we're developing lunar settlements and they're designed for, for survival and they use, for example, waste as the wall lining and radiation shielding, how is that going to change our perception and understanding of waste on earth? Um, you know, there's, there's multiple technologies that have come off of the ISS that are now part of our day-to-day -day life, like Velcro, um, 
which may not have made the, ma the, the most massive impact, but I'm sure there's someone who has studied it. And um, I think there's a chance for lunar settlements or, and to be able to really affect how we, how we communicate, how we view interpersonal relationships. Um, you know, of course, partial gravity will have an effect on that. Um, and yeah, I just want to encourage anyone who is interested in, in looking at human culture and even with even if you're within engineering to understand that sort of human aspect of what you're studying. Um, and of course, if anyone wants to add me on LinkedIn, you are more than welcome. And this is just a slide of references. But that's everything. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jane, for this talk. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't know if there is a question from the audience, but I have one. Can you... Uh, give us some more, more insights about how space anthropology uh, is, uh, let me say, the impact that it has at the academic level in the sense if there are classes, courses, uh, I don't know, how it is uh, situated in the academy. And then if there is some uh, collaboration with the industry, since the next speaker is from Airbus, so I would like to say if there is some collaboration or connection at, the, at that certain level. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a limited um, field at the moment. There are a few experts around the world. Um, there's a couple who are based in, mostly in, in universities at the moment. There's a project from um, UCL where I'm, my alma mater, mater uh, where they're looking at the culture of the ISS at the moment. Um, so there's a current ongoing study funded by the European Research Council um, looking at how um, culture in space is evolving. Um, so I think if you want to study it, I would recommend reaching out to any of those organizations, um, finding anthropologists online. I think a lot of we're going to see a lot of anthropologists um, focusing on the space sector who were traditionally in other sectors. So a lot of people from religion, for example, have come in to look at, um, you know, uh, religion on the ISS. Um, so that's that part. And then collaborating with industry. I think that's that's where it gets a little complicated, but I think there's still a possibility for it um, in terms of uh, because space is so sort of closely related to national security and to trade secrets. <laughs> it is difficult to gain access to those places, but um yeah, with the correct sort of um, ethical guidelines, I think it's possible for anthropologists to be part of the industry as well as advising um, how to go forward. You know, I wouldn't trust an anthropologist to build a space settlement, but I also wouldn't trust an engineer to engineer a uh, social space. Will be, will be will be very useful to design the, the yeah. settlement. Yeah. And fact, there is a question from the Zoom. Is there any hypothesis about our living on the moon further from the Earth? Could affect our behaviors. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, as I mentioned, kind of in the conclusion, I think like partial gravity is something that would really change human relationships. Like even if we look at the ISS as a as a case study for the moon, um, you know, that kind of how do you hug someone in outer space when you're sort of aloft floating someone? How do those how do those little changes in in gravity um, change how you are? And you know, if we're looking always at the moon and we're living in this sort of confined environment, how is our culture going to um, develop when we're so few of us up there um, and we're having to live in these circular uh, circular loops? You know, how will we view waste? How will we, if we're growing vegetables in human excrement, how will that change how we relate to each other in our biomedical models? Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much for the talk. I hope to see you again in some other events and also to be in time and your time. And, uh, no problem. You have the possibility to uh, recover sometimes. And now we have a break. We'll see you or any other connected on Zoom in 15 minutes in, instead of 30 minutes. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good day.